It's uh, 401, so we'll start the meeting. Thanks uh, for attending for everyone. This is our holiday meeting, so it's kind of exciting. It's one of the fun meetings of the year. I'll call it to order, and I'll ask that uh, we'll call the roll. Uh, Steve Miserak, I'm here. Larry? Here. Okay. Or there. Tom? Here. Good. Nadine? Present. Eli? Here. Okay. Dave? Okay. Dave's not here. Stan? At present. Here. Okay. Thank you. So everyone but Dave is here. Chief, I see you're here. So we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, since we don't have anyone from the community, I won't repeat the phone number to call in. But uh, if we get anybody, Chief, please let me know so I can recognize them. And we'll get uh, public expression time if someone joins us. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, Eli, thank you so much for doing the minutes again. They were really terrific. Uh, have, has everyone had a chance to read the minutes? And are there any additions or corrections? Hearing none, I would move uh, to approve. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Eli, thank you so much. Eli, how are you feeling today? Are you frisky and ready to do it again? Do you, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah. I was like, why? What did you hear? Yeah, of course, I'll do it again. That would be wonderful. Deeply appreciated. Okay, I have, a, uh, I have a report from the Fire Foundation. And uh, it could be lengthy, but I, I won't take too much time. I will tell you that we have not fully completed our fundraiser for the year which I have referred to as the 2020 Annis Horribilis No Crab, I'm Still Crabby, San Rafael Fire Foundation, I hope it's not annual, holiday outreach fundraiser. So this was the non-crab feed fundraiser outreach and we've done very well. And to date, as of Tuesday, the amount raised in our fundraiser is $20,821. Well, and that excellent. is prior, that is really wonderful. And that is prior to Jeff Kramer's matching donation. So really we're talking over $40,000 for the annual fundraiser. Uh, we've sent out 20 challenge coins. We've had a lot of participation and that is just really great. And actually that surpasses most of the crab feeds that we've had and is really wonderful. We have a new commissioner joining us. A new commissioner? Dave's Dave? signing in. Dave is signing in. Okay, great. Hi, Hi folks. I, I'm having a hard time getting on with my computer, but I'm able to join by my phone. Fantastic. And you have an archive photo there, which is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little more hair in that photo. It looks like a professional headshot, so that's very nice. It comes <laughs> across quite. well. So at the present time, the uh, total amount in the Fire Foundation coffers is 43,543. And as I mentioned, we don't yet have Jeff's matching to the 20,800, but he was gonna wait till the end of the month when all the donations were uh, said and done. And so things are looking very good for the Fire Foundation. That's that. Now, you, you may have read a small little article in the newspaper about uh, the Fire Foundation helping out for a Thanksgiving dinner for the folks that have joined us on. Chief, is it just AmeriCorps or it's more than AmeriCorps? The student, the college students who are uh, doing tree trimming for us? The NCCC and AmeriCorps crews, yes. Great. So uh, Captain DeLambert came to Jack Devlin prior to Thanksgiving and said, you know, uh, these kids really don't get much of a food allowance every day. And in fact, it is meager, uh, probably by design to some extent, I'll explain that. But uh, Captain DeLambert thought it would be nice to, to fund a Thanksgiving dinner for all these volunteers, these college students that are uh, cutting trees and cutting back uh, brush and such. And so Jack made a donation from the Fire Foundation. We talked it over with members of the Fire Foundation. I kicked in some money and we were able to help fund this Thanksgiving dinner for all the participants from AmeriCorps and the other uh, people. There were about 20 people, I think, all together. So that got some press. In fact, one of the donations to the Fire Foundation fundraiser specifically mentioned 
that Thanksgiving dinner and he said the, he wanted the money to go to help support that. So the publicity was good and the, I understand the dinner was really appreciated by everyone. And in fact, Andy's Market threw in some free sides and things and it was, it was quite a feast. Chief, I don't know if you have any more on that or if you're aware of what took place, but it was, it was a nice endeavor. No, I just want to, on behalf of those crews, extend a thank you to everyone who um, was very supportive of the, the Thanksgiving meals. I know that, you know, it's kind of difficult for those individuals being that they're away from family and, you know, they're in a, a um, remote area right now, kind of sequestered. And unfortunately, uh, some of them have been kind of quarantined um, because uh, some of the crews that just showed up December 1st, one of the individuals tested positive for COVID. And so... They're going to be returning back to Sacramento for the next couple of weeks and then joining us uh, perhaps in the first part of Feb uh, January once everyone's um, been cleared to, to return. But uh, the other two crews that you had, you had provided the assistance to, they're actually going to be here until right around the 22nd of December from what I understand. So this is, um, this is uh, something special for them. I don't know that this has ever happened in the past, and I'm sure it helped make their Thanksgiving a lot specialer than it would have been if specialer is a word. It is. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> it is now. Okay. It's actually hey, on the was a word, so <laughs> specialer is fine. <laughs> well, we did that. Now, I don't know if you, everybody knows this, but the AmeriCrew Corps and the other people that come as volunteers, basically, they, they are paid something, but they get a, a food allowance of $5 a day per person. Wow. Now, as Larry knows, uh, a special latte can cost $5. That doesn't go very far. But part, part of the thinking behind it, from what I understand, and I talked to Chief Gray about this uh, a year or two ago, is that a small amount of money allows them to pull it together and work together to provide their own meals. And while it's probably not adequate for great nutrition, it is part of the bonding experience. So that is what it is. And that's, that's what they get reimbursed. But uh, it was really nice that we were able to help make Thanksgiving something very special. Okay, that's it for that. Um, anything else in the Fire Foundation? Does anybody want to ask any questions or anything? If not, I will move on to the next topic, which is the uh, Historic Subcommittee. I don't have any update on that, but I, I do have some good news, which is that a pair of items from the 19th century that uh, belonged to the San Rafael Fire Department came on eBay in the past week, and I was able to successfully buy that. And I'm going to be presenting it to the fire department. And uh, I won't say what it is. I'll give more detail about the next meeting. I don't have it in my possession yet, but it's nice artifacts. It is related to the San Rafael Fire Department. It is from the San Rafael Fire Department, comes with a story. And I'm going to present that to Chief White. And Chief White, maybe we can do something to go on the IJ, some sort of little presentation to get the idea of the historic presentation in the lobby out to the public and with this donation, get it started. So I'll talk to you more about that in the next few weeks, but uh, that is something that we, will, we do have coming. It's in the mail. So that should be interesting. That sounds very exciting. Thank you so much. Yeah, you don't even know what it is yet, so it's great. Oh, but, but it's anything historic is important to me, so that's okay. It, it's real and it has an interesting story and it's got an interesting provenance. So that's the historic subcommittee. Uh, Fire Commission member reports. Larry, do you have anything you'd like to share with the commission today? Well, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, do a share screen here. And if I can, I will pop up this... Uh, uh, I'm going to hit the share screen button and let's see what happens. Uh, yep, the host has disabled share screen. So if the host would enable share screen, uh, I don't know how that works. Uh, let me try it again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it just went crazy, and I now I don't know. So right now we're seeing Chief White's screen. Yeah. Okay. Did you tell us about it, Larry? 
uh, it, just a, a a street shot uh, of the uh, fire department. This is a this is a uh, community. Let me get back here. It's a community of uh, fifty thousand. Uh, Crucisita is a uh, Crucisita is a city that was created by the government of Mexico by a, a, a quasi-public corporation called Fonature that's responsible for uh, development in Mexico. And the area is uh, all, of mo all, most of the property is, is uh, waterfront, federally owned and designated for uh, resort hotels and things of that nature. So as th those things built out, they have to have a place for uh, the hotel workers and everybody else that supports uh, the tourism industry to live. And Crucisita is the town that uh, was created for that. Uh, there is one fire station. Uh, the uh, medical, uh, pre-hospital medical care is handled by the Mexican Red Cross uh, and they're located right next to the, uh, to the fire station. Uh, for anybody that's ever been to Mexico or towns with uh, volunteer fire departments, uh, you know that uh, much of the equipment, if it was in the U.S., would be found in a museum. And that's certainly the case here. But uh, by golly, they provide uh, fire protection for uh, this entire town, and uh, uh, it seems to work. So... That's all I've got, uh, and uh, the weather's uh, in the mid 70s and uh, mild, and uh, surfing is great. Fantastic. Uh, by the way, I, I went to Oaxaca in Mexico many years ago, and they're a city of a million people, and they have one fire station. Yes, we we've yeah. been there. It, it's it's an trip. hour. It's, it's a day's drive from here through, yeah. through the mountains, and it's a very interesting drive. But a beautiful city. A great place to visit. Thank you, Larry. Tom, any report today from Tom Weathers? Don't have anything to report. I am working on, ironically, I'm, I'm doing a fire code for a tribe. And so I'm having to look at different ordinances and codes on, on fire safety and fire prevention. So that's been interesting, but uh, nothing to report to the commission today. Thank you. Okay, Tom, what, what tribe are you working with? Uh, Torres Martinez Desert Cahuilla Indians. Okay. They're down Angel. by the Salton Sea. Salton Sea, Imperial County. And, and they've got a lot of, you get these terrible jurisdiction problems where say a reservation start or a fire starts on county land, but then it moves on to the reservation. The state and the state fire department has no jurisdiction on the reservation. So technically they can't come onto the reservation to fight the fire. But obviously the fire doesn't know the boundary. And so we're trying to work out an MOU and, and adopt uh, compatible fire codes. And so it's, it's been an interesting process. Yeah. I have heard stories that it is a problem throughout the state because I have a friend who lives in Calaveras County and there was a big fire up there, but it started next door in a second county. Mm -hmm. And Cal Fire takes jurisdiction wherever the first fire starts, even if they don't know the other county as well. It gets to be jurisdictionally very complicated. Yep. Big yep. problems. So that's interesting. Thank you for uh, doing that. Nothing else from me. Okay, Tom. Nadine, anything you'd like to share with the Fire Commission today? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to. I always have so much gratitude for our safety employees and especially our firefighters who are going into all sorts of different situations, but especially now, yet again, with the um, pandemic, you know, kind of hitting top numbers and um, the shelter in place being reenacted. I'm just very grateful for all of the work that they do. And I know we all are, but Chief, I hope you can pass that along on the commission's behalf. I, I can't imagine being out there doing what they're doing in general. And yet, and then now you've got this added um, real, scare, you know, and um, their families and, you know, everything they want to go back home to. So I'm just really appreciative of that. 
It's Thank you. Can I, can I comment on that just for a moment? Yes. Well, <clears throat> Nadine, I really appreciate that that, that sentiment and um, the encouragement. We've had uh, one of our members test positive just uh, about 10 days ago, and I spoke with him yesterday, and he's in great spirits. Uh, he's recovering fine and he'll probably be back to work here in the next few days. But, you know, he shared the fact that the ordeal um, – just left a lot of uncertainty and anxiety and other thoughts that, you know, you can only imagine you would go through. And he felt guilt. You know, he felt like he let his crew down and his department down. And I just, I really appreciated hearing that because it kind of spoke to who he was as a, as a public servant. Um, that being said, I tried to encourage him to understand that this could happen to any of us, me included. And let me knock on wood so it doesn't happen. But the idea is, um, <clears throat> we, we've seen it also potentially create scares in our administrative staff. So with the rising cases that are happening, you know, within the county and within the state, you know, this is becoming a very real problem that's coming closer and closer to us here in, in San Rafael than we would prefer. So um, we've been trying to give reminders to our staff to continue to do their due diligence, much like they were when the pandemic was at its inception, um, just so that folks understand that, we're not out of this yet, even though there's vaccines that are you know, literally you know, weeks away, we're still not out of this and there's gonna be some time to come before any sense of normalcy will, will, will resume. So we've been trying to you know, reiterate those, those things and still encourage people and provide them with information in the event they feel they may have been exposed um, or have been contacted by the department saying that there's a concern they may have been nearby um, proximal to someone who's been um, diagnosed as positive. So, it's been a, a really difficult and trying thing for our members. Um, you can see psychologically uh, and to some degree physically the, the, the stress that it's placed on us. So, uh, but to your, to your um, statement, I have great appreciation and admiration for everyone who keeps pressing through despite this because it's the silent unseen threat and it's real. So we, we appreciate that. Thank you for your support. That's very good. Nadine, I agree with you. When I was working, we used to talk about having the courage to see the next patient and to go in there and not knowing what's coming next. And I think of the courage that the firefighters use every time they go on a call. It's just very, very impressive. And uh, Chief, give our regards to the firefighters. We'll have a small gift for every fire station this year, but they are doing an amazing job and these are very difficult situations. Thank you. Nadine, anything else you wanted to add? I'm going to miss seeing everybody at our annual commissions and boards party and hope that we could do it next year. Outstanding. <laughs> Let's keep our fingers crossed. That is great. Yeah. Knock on wood. Thank you. Uh, Eli, anything you'd like to share with the fire commission today? Uh, yeah, I have two things. Um, one is more anecdotal and the other is a recognition. Um, there have been twice in my life, two instances in my life where uh, an alarm went off, both times was a carbon monoxide alarm. Um, and uh, I knew immediately to uh, take my family out of the house um, and uh, make sure that I called the, the, the fire department. And both times they did come and both times, thankfully it was, it was just an alarm that had uh, errantly gone off. But it was, uh, it was a personal reminder of how critical functional alarms are. Uh, I've gone through my house this season and actually replaced every single one. I won't say how many, but it's more than I would care to say. And, uh, but um, it is, you know, of the many things that we can do to defend um, our residences, it is, it is so key and one of the first lines of uh, really defense to make sure that we can maintain life. So um, I don't know how many people will hear this message. And I know that uh, when it comes to uh, Commissioner Funkelsrud, um, it'll be, hopefully we'll get some more messaging out to the public, but I can't stress enough how critical it is to make sure that we have functional uh, smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, the second thing I would say is just recognition of uh, a commissioner here who's been responsible for ensuring uh, the financial safety of our city, which is Nadine, um, I've actually observed Nadine present to the city council in the last uh, month or so, and um, her presenting on what measures that have had to be taken through um, this year specifically 
have been outstanding. And I will say, I've looked at how other cities have been faring, and um, I don't think other cities are exhibiting the same kind of responsibility and foresight. So uh, thank you, Nadine, for uh, oftentimes being the bearer of very difficult messages and making very tough decisions, as well as also surviving an audit for this whole thing, which is, I think, really outstanding as well. So uh, I just want to make sure you're recognized. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, Eli, do you think you could put some, some little notice on our website or uh, working with Dave, put it in our messaging about carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors and those types of things, change your batteries, get the, that would be, that's great. If it helped one sure. person, it would be worthwhile. Definitely. Thank you, I Will. Super, that's a great idea. Uh, Dave, what would you like to share with the fire commission today? All right. Thanks for the warm up there, Eli. Uh, good segue. So um, I did reach out to Quinn and uh, David after our last fire commission meeting and found some resources that I thought would be really helpful for those types of fire safety seasonal messages. Um, in that case, it, it was for Thanksgiving, but, but also um, uh, Christmas holidays uh, and then even New Year's and, and specific to the carbon monoxide and smoke detectors. I, I think a, a best practice for a lot of people is to just on January 1st, remember to check the batteries, replace them. Um, so uh, I found a, uh, a great resource that is with the um, National Fire Protection Association. They actually have a lot of templates for these types of messages and some really fantastic graphics to go with it. So, so I shot that over to Quinn and David. I haven't heard back. Um, Chief, I would be happy to, to do some of the posting. Um, I'm not sure if I would be authorized to do that. Um, I, I need the, the Twitter password and uh, account credentials, but um, I'm, I'm happy to do that if, if uh, Quinn and, and David, you know, I know that they've got a lot on their plate right now and this may not be a, a priority. So. Um, so I'd be happy to do that if that's something that, that would be allowable or, or you would be okay with that. Um, I can certainly see the value in uh, supplemental help from the commission. So if, if there is a opportunity for us to share the, the password and the other credentials you need to access it and upload it, um, I would just probably need to ensure that whatever you're looking to upload, it passes through either Quinn, David, or Chief Senate as an example to mm -hmm. that it's, it's what we want to upload uh, and, and in the correct format. So um, I'll, sure. I'll look into that and follow up with all three of them uh, after this meeting, actually. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great time right now, given uh, a lot of people have Christmas trees in, in their homes and, and there's certainly a lot of safety messages around that. And then, and then the New Year's messages too. So uh, more than happy to help with that in, in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Anything yeah. else? Uh, that's it. Thanks. Great. Thanks for being the engine and promoting those ideas of information sharing and education. That's extremely helpful. Deeply appreciate sure. it. Happy to do it. Stan, anything you'd like to share with the Fire Commission today? Um, I have a question slash proposal for the group. Uh, we have three things going on in our community uh, right now that uh, I for one personally feel could use uh, recognition from us. Uh, one is the retirement of uh, Mayor Phillips and two of course in hand with that is uh, Kate Collins now our new mayor that those are two separate issues, of course. And the third, coming up shortly, if I'm not mistaken and looked at the wrong calendar, we have a retiring police chief as uh, Chief Bishop is about to step aside. So it, it struck me that as a group, uh, it would be, I think, appropriate to recognize all three of them for the service they have provided and the service they are about to provide depending. What language to use, I don't know. What format to use, I don't know. But uh, throw it on the table for discussion. I like it. Anyone else? No, I think that's a, I think that's a fine idea. 
could do uh, a resolution. Okay, I would, I'd be happy to uh, put a little format together in some language and then share it with the group and uh, with no pride of authorship and whatever it turns out to be, it, it would be, you know, turned out to be from us all. <clears throat> Chief White, can I ask you a question? Always. Okay. Uh, we had talked about recognizing Len Thompson for the Fire Foundation. Um, has anything been done on that? Do we have any certificate or any? Um, no, but we can draft that uh, within a matter of an hour. So it's yeah. just a matter of what wording we want to use and, and um, whose names do we want actually on the certificate acknowledging uh, yeah. that. I, I don't imagine you want it coming just from me when it's really the commissioners who, you know, he's really provided a lot of invaluable assistance to as a, yeah. as a member. So I just, I just need a little bit of information and I'll be able to get that, you know, turned out to you within a day. No problem. Okay. And I, I, I really don't know that it's that urgent, but here's, here's my thought. Uh, Stan made some important points. Gary is retiring. Kate's coming in as mayor. Uh, Chief Bishop is retiring. Uh, we talked about recognizing Len Thompson for helping found the Fire uh, Foundation. And actually, in my mind, the person who does about 99% of the work for the Fire Foundation is Jack Devlin. And if we recognize Len, I would love to recognize Jack also. And I'm trying to think of a thread through those five, five people. Uh, the certificates that you give out to new hires, once they join the department, people that retire the, the based on the old certificate with the you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I gave a, uh, should I say, uh, an acknowledgement to three of our deep defensible space inspectors with that original um, nostalgic look. I really yeah. like that look, and I think they enjoyed it, too. Beautiful. So they don't necessarily have to be as big as those, or if the size is the same and consistent. And if we can modify that for these different recognitions, fire foundation, mayor, police chief, et cetera, that would, to me, would be really nice. And in that way, it's something looking official. You could uh, have it from the chief and the fire commission. I think you signing it's the most important. Uh, if you want someone else to sign it, I'm happy to do it. But I think you signing it is the key. You're, you're the uh, leader of the entire organization and you carry the most weight. And uh, so I think something along those lines would be really nice. And I don't think there's going to be any parties for the mayor or for the police chief that I, I know about, and certainly I wouldn't recommend any at this time, but if we could do it some way that it gets presented by you on our behalf, that would be wonderful. I, I don't know if that's very expensive, chief. I don't know if you have a budget for that. I don't know what it costs. Maybe you could keep me informed. And if you need some uh, support from the community, I'd be happy to help with that. But I think those kind of certificates are really popular and they're perfect for putting on the wall. Uh, I appreciate the offer of support. Um, I guess the question would be, what kind of framing do we want? Do we want the paper frame that they come in, or do we want to use a an actual frame that they would mount on the wall? So I would kind of leave maybe that to either the group here to decide, or maybe to the individual who receives the certificate to decide. Um, but if you have a preference, we can go either either direction. The 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 framing that we used and presented to the um, defensible space inspectors recently was a paper frame. And I think the ones they gave to the probationary members upon graduation from the recruit academy may have been an actual physical frame, but yeah. I can't imagine it wouldn't have been more than, you know, five or $10 from office uh, depot or, or um, target or wherever they may have picked up the frame from. Yeah. Typically in the past, I think Diana has bought those somewhere and they're not expensive. Just a simple black frame. Uh, very simple. Yeah. Right. The, those are available, and I think Diana knows where to get them. Okay. Super. I, you know, I, uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, it, the certificate, I think, is a, is a fine idea. Um, I, I think what we might want to do is to have uh, uh, a letter of appreciation uh, as part of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve, I don't remember whether, do we actually have a uh, Santa Fe Fire Commission letterhead? It, and if we do, I think that's the appropriate way to, to do it. 
uh, with uh, your signature? As far as I know, we don't. What I have done is I've sometimes I've taken a patch or even a business card and, and Xeroxed it, copied it. Yeah, and, uh, make, make something up. Something. I had some cards made some years ago, uh, but those ran out a long time ago. They were sort of uh, greeting card size, not, not letters, but cards okay. that had the patch on the front, our names on the back. So we did have that at one time, but I don't, I don't have anything currently at this point. I think we, we could probably just in Microsoft Word, we could mock up a, uh, uh, a, uh, a letterhead that, uh, yeah. you know, could be used uh, anytime the commission uh, wants to send a letter of recognition or what have you. I think that'd be a good idea. Okay. Uh, I, you know, when I get back, I, I can certainly tackle that. That's a good idea. So maybe Stan, you'll be working on the wordsmithing of a letter while the chief works on a certificate and we'll have, you know, both in hand by the end of the month. Fine. Happy That'd to be wonderful. All right, great. I'll share Stan, you're very good with words. All right, uh, nothing new, no, nothing more. If you want to quote Shakespeare, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, we'll finish the commission reports. Um, chief? The chief report. Okay. All right. Well, um, kind of a semi-eventful month um, in more ways than one. I think I already shared with you some of what's been happening uh, when it comes to COVID. So I'll kind of skip over that, but I'll touch on vaccinations shortly. Um, our AmeriCorps personnel that arrived late October, unfortunately, two of the three crews are actually going to be heading out, as I indicated. Um, in a couple of weeks. They, they've done a, a massive amount of work in both San Rafael and Marinwood. And so we're just really you know, thrilled that they've been able to come in and, and make such a difference in the open spaces and creating defensible space and working with property owners. Um, I've got an example in particular that I shared with the Marinwood Board of Directors last night regarding um, a place on Miller Creek Road, which has uh, been a longstanding problem with some of the properties there and the former fire chief um, Tom Roach did his best to try to gain compliance there and just ha really had some difficulty with some of the the, uh, the residents. And for some reason or another, I'm assuming it's because we've had the consistent effort and we've had, you know, individuals such as Sean Rule, who I'll speak about in just a moment, really do above and beyond in the way of having meaningful dialogue and educating our community members about the importance of compliance and um, safety first for themselves and for their neighbors. They were able to finally convince these individuals to remove the juniper and other species from their properties um, in such a way that created a, a almost a, a new aesthetic in the front yard. You can see the house now. You can see, you know, the front yard. You can see things that probably, you know, had been hidden for, you know, at least the last couple of decades. And so um, I say all that to say that effort is being replicated in multiple areas. And so uh, as we look at the other team that had just started on, on December 1st, when they arrived, they were doing some more of the same work. Uh, I'm sorry that they're going to have to break for a couple of weeks, but safety first. And so when they come back, they'll be here roughly until around the first uh, week or two in March, and then they'll be heading out. And it's my hope that we'll be able to actually sustain this effort from NCCC and AmeriCorps crews almost year round. Because if you look at middle of March, it's about the time where we expect, um, depending on you know weather conditions, which have not been projected to be very favorable in the way of rain during the, the winter and early spring, uh, it could be a great and ideal time to continue the effort with more volunteers to continue to do the work to create more defensible space and reduce our risk to our communities. And so with that, um, recently the crew crews at the time I generated a report, had been working in the areas of Sun Valley and Victor Jones Parks. They were also in Contempo Marin in that area doing work. And then um, the last chipper day that Fire Safe Marin was going to um, host, I think came up maybe about a week and a half ago. And so um, this is an interesting thing because I really see a lot of value in the chipper days. And I think um, they, they're competitive. It's, it's going to be something where a lot of neighborhoods are going to be interested, especially some of the, the far wise communities are going to see the value of these chipper days and try to really maximize their use. I see so much value in the chippers. I'm almost thinking maybe we should 
look to purchase our own chipper and figure out how to get our staff out there so that we can do this more often than just relying on the vendors who are bidding for the opportunities to deliver the chipper um, opportunities to different communities. That being said, there's an added cost and component that I recognize to this, which is who's going to staff and operate and transport this thing on a regular basis. And so um, while the idea is great initially, I'm just not sure financially it's really the sound and best choice, but we're going to kind of sort that out and figure it out because it may actually work to be um, okay to con consider depending on what we do in the way of um, bringing on additional staff, defensible space or seasonal temporary staff next year as an example. So we'll see. Um, the photos on the, the front report show prime examples of, of folks limbing up trees. Uh, you can see clearly carports now, you can see fencing between neighbors. And I wish I had brought that photograph for you guys to see of the juniper the, on the before and after. I think I have a picture of it. I might be able to share it with my screen now that I think about it. So if you give me one second, I'll do that. Okay. I tried to sheen square, sheen square or share screen a moment ago and it didn't quite work out by allowing Mr. Luckham to be a co-host. So let's see what happens here now. Okay. I'm just gonna hold it up and see. Um, if you look, can you see anything I'm sharing here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's you literally couldn't see three or four cars in the driveway of this property because there was so much juniper. Mm. And it was hard to walk down the street and the sidewalk and then even park your vehicle on the street next to it because there was just so much. And so our crews went in and this is what they did. <laughs> wow. They cleaned it up. Yes, and that's their AmeriCorps wow. crew there after the fact. And so efforts like this that you know, we really are appreciative of. And I, as I looked at some of the other photos that I didn't include in the report, it showed literally three or four cars <laughs> that were hidden from street view and from sidewalk view. So it just, um, it's one of those things where I just, I'm really appreciative of their efforts. Can't say enough about them. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, COVID. You know, things have moved rapidly. In my report last week, we were talking about the, the county moving from orange to red. Well, we've already moved from orange to now purple, or excuse me, from red to now purple. Uh, we were one of the last few counties to, to stay in the red tier, including I think San Mateo. Uh, unfortunately, everybody's reality reverted relatively quickly. We were just the last two to, to do so. Um, and with that, now the governor has actually issued the, the shelter in place order. Um, we had originally intended some of our services to reopen on November 12th, but ironically, just within a day or two of that, the spike reached such an alarming rate that city officials uh, wisely decided that this was not the time and they decided to put that and postpone that effort um, to, to allow access to city services on site. Um, and I mentioned one of our firefighters testing positive. Um, and the other two members actually tested negative. So that was a great sign and they were, at, they were relieved. They'll be coming back on duty. Um, unfortunately, we had another individual who was taking a class somewhere um, be exposed to someone that they felt was clearly a positive exposure. So I think everyone in that class may have been put into a quarantine situation. Uh, we did the same part. Remember that member ended up testing negative, which was great. The downside is even after that, we had another employee whose um, significant other works in another fire department in Contra Costa County. And that individual was working closely with a company officer who tested positive. That individual um, actually started showing signs and symptoms, I believe he tested positive. And his girlfriend who works for us ended up um, needing to quarantine just to be sure she started to develop the signs and symptoms, you know, just a few days ago. So we're really hopeful that um, 
it's a fever or, or something else, but not really the COVID. Um, but it just kind of shows you the domino effect and how quickly things are happening. And this is from first responder to first responder. And then unfortunately, one first responder household to another first responder household, that, which brings it now into the work environment unknowingly sometimes. So, um, but we still continue to encourage everyone, as I stated earlier, to do their due diligence, to mask, to socially distance, to take every precaution. I mean, even uh, I've, I've sent out an email recently acknowledging what's been going on in the organization and reminding folks to simply not shake hands, not embrace, but to do something like this. When you see someone, greet them this way. And some folks joked about the movie Black Panther because I guess in Wakanda they did something similar. And I said, well, I, I've seen that well before the Black Panther movie, but you know, I, I don't know if it was something that was based on religion or something based on preference, but it seemed like an endearing way of still greeting people when you nod your head and cross your arms in front of you. And so simple things like that, I'm trying to encourage people to continue to, to do because I think, um, and I even had to get on a captain the other day, unfortunately, and I won't say his name, but he showed up in a vehicle um, and basically got out the vehicle and started to interact with everyone. I said, Cap, I need you to put your mask on. He says, well, I've been riding by myself. I said, that's fine while you're in the car, but now you're out the car and you're with us. So he begrudgingly went over and, and got his mask and, you know, he didn't say anything, but you could just kind of sense that he didn't like being called out on it, but it was the prime time to call him out on it in front of everyone else so that they understood the expectation as well. So, um, that being said, we're, we're, we're trying to do our due diligence, but this is a, a unique dynamic that we're facing. And, um, you know, our, our members are still trying to learn how to disinfect appropriately. We're trying to look at how we can clean the apparatus properly, keep our equipment, our clothing, um, everything clean, but yet still be safe in what we do using, using face shields, face masks, and other measures. So um, we'll continue on with that, and hopefully we'll be able to keep the, the exposures and the potential positives down to what we've seen already, if nothing more, moving forward. Um, vaccinations. Uh, at the time I wrote this report several days ago, they had, they had um, spoken about individuals in Marin County who would be first and slated to receive vaccinations early on, and those included the skilled nursing facility staff uh, and probably the elderly within those facilities as well. Uh, and eventually um, the hospital workers who are, you know, on the front lines of this in a way that, that none of our first responders are. But um, I certainly thought that made a lot of sense, uh, given the, the rate of transmission and, and the exposure to uh, danger they have there. Um, I think Dr. Willis indicated that there needed to be at least 20,000 uh, vaccinations. And that was because there's a second application required. You need to start with one and then roughly about three to four weeks later, administer a second dose. Um, but these things have to be kept in the freezers. You all probably heard and read. And um, I think everyone's trying to mobilize now to, to figure out who's got these freezers or who can get these freezers and then do their best to actually put this um, vaccination and keep it where it should be at the temperature it should be, which I believe is somewhere around minus 100 degrees. And I, and I always marvel at this because I thought, how much cold do you get after freezing? You know, what <laughs> minus 400 degrees. What does that mean? I mean, it just, it seems to me, um, cold is cold. at some point you just don't notice the difference. It's, you know, it, it's beyond you. But um, all that to say, um, it, it, from what I understand, these, these, uh, these vaccinations were already um, offered up beginning yesterday or the day before in Great Britain. They did rigorous testing on the Pfizer vaccination and determined that they were roughly 95% um, um, effective and without any significant or serious side effects for any of the um, folks that they tested, which was very surprising, uh, especially when I saw last night that there were maybe two people who had adverse reactions to the, um, to the vac vaccination. But apparently um, that may be expected in one for every so many hundred thousand individuals from what I get. But um, I'm not a, a physician. I have no idea, but I'm really hopeful that between Pfizer and Moderna, there's going to be some form of vaccine uh, that's going to be suitable for every individual. If someone has an allergic reaction to one, perhaps they can try the other. Um, uh, emergency incidents. Uh, medical evacuation. Our firefighters uh, were assisting an injured cyclist, and this is not 
a uncommon thing. This has actually been happening more often than I could share with you guys um, in some of our hill areas. Uh, but in this particular instance, on a trail in the Harry Barbier Memorial Park open space area, our individuals were able to go up and provide assistance to an individual who had significant injuries. That, that patient was flown to the John Muir Medical Center. Um, there is a device, I believe, you guys supported the purchase of. And I got a photograph of it, and it's in my next month's report. But I just wanted you to see um, the device at work, uh, at least capture an image of the device, um, and, and show you that it's being used and it's being used effectively. And I, I think um, whoever the person was that developed this, they, they developed something that's really going to help spare the backs of firefighters and ambulance personnel alike. And I say that with having an experience of a kid going down who was about 13 years old and 250 pounds going down on a trail about a half a mile away from the main road thoroughfare. And I and two other individuals had to carry him because the fourth member, as soon as he picked up the gurney, decided his, or the uh, Stokes basket, decided his back hurt. And we had to carry this individual for a half a mile. This device is phenomenal. And you don't have to carry anyone. You just roll this individual out, big durable tire on it that allows you to traverse pretty much any rock or debris or boulder. And so I want to thank you all for the supporting that purchase. That, that's going to be really helpful to our personnel and to the community members who find themselves in need of something like this uh, in the event they have the misfortune of crashing on a, on a bike or falling off a horse or, you know, running and twisting their ankle or whatever happens on some of these trails that, that can happen. So uh, the other event is a high speed collision that occurred. Um, where San Rafael members rescued two occupants from a vehicle that struck a utility pole after traveling at a really high rate of speed. And so um, seen enough of these over the years where a driver overestimates their skills or they, they drive too fast for the conditions of the road, they lose control of the vehicle and crash into something or roll over. And, you know, these can usually have devastating and, and deadly outcomes. Uh, I think there was something on the news this morning with the rollover that occurred in the South Bay that was a deadly incident. Um, so when I, I see some of the things I've seen over the years, I marvel at how people can survive or how divine intervention has come in to, to help prevent them from being another um, fatality, if you will. But in this particular case, the occupants were, you know, they were injured, but they survived. So, but the power was knocked out for a period of time. Um, and I think I mentioned that the structure fire, no, I did, I mentioned uh, Contempo Marin being an area where uh, they had performed some uh, recent um, fuel removal, but there was also a structure fire in a mobile home in that area. Um, luckily, no exposures, but significant damage to the mobile home itself. And to uh, Commissioner Hill's point, the importance of the smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, uh, those were not functioning. And... So that being said, um, a dead battery or an, a, an outdated or outmoded piece of detection equipment helps no one. And so uh, if nothing else, first of the year or whenever we do daylight savings time, be sure to check those batteries. Uh, in this case, apparently that's what was happening is the batteries uh, were dead. And so it was non-functional and folks were not alerted until, you know, actual um, well into the fire. So more damage occurred to the mobile home as a result. Um, last two items, hiring. Uh, really fortunate to have the, the help of Quinn Gardner and Sean Rule and some of our newer staff uh, and also David Catalanoto sit on interview panels to help us select um, fixed term employees that are gonna serve as vegetation management specialists. These individuals are gonna be here year round through MWPA funding. Uh, unlike the defensible space seasonal temporary staff, where we started with six and we ended up with three, three high caliber employees, but three out of six clearly was not our intent. We needed more boots on the ground to conduct more inspections, to do more community outreach and, and address more of the risk in the, in the community. And so with that, we determined that the vegetation management specialist, specialist classification um, really assisted and provided more flexibility with our needs both during the fire season, if you want to consider the fire season an eight or nine month window, but also post fire season, and also with some of our um, efforts involving emergency management. So 
we've got some very capable and, and skilled individuals who are being onboarded who, you know, have a variety of skills and, and, and experience and education in the way of ecological backgrounds, environmentally sound backgrounds, um, fire service and suppression backgrounds, and some who are relatively new who just demonstrated as defensible space employees um, that they were capable. We, we kept those individuals, one in particular, Simon Wright. Um, he's going to remain with us as a vegetation management um, and specialist. And we hope that in much the same way uh, vegetation management supervisor Sean Rule did, we hope that Simon will continue to learn and grow and become one of those model employees who help guide the program as we move forward with our MWPA and with our wildfire prevention and preventative action plans and our ordinances and everything else that we're doing to try to ensure that our community is well prepared and um, capable of meeting the needs of the community in, a, in the midst of all the crisis that we find ourselves dealing with right now when it comes to wildfire and other activities that are emergency management based. And so, you know, we're really excited about that. But I have to tell you, as much as we're excited about that, we're very disappointed. Um, uh, it's, it's very sad for me to announce I'm excited for him, but at the same time, I'm sad that we're, we're losing Sean Rule. Um, Sean Rule has been a fixture here for the last couple of years and has gained a lot of historical perspective in a short period of time. And he's been our vegetation management supervisor. Um, he, he's helped to coordinate and provide so much, uh, I guess you would say, hmm, foundation skeleton to the body, if you will. Without him, it wouldn't have moved or wouldn't have become what it could have become in just the last couple of years. And I know he's been very instrumental in assisting me when I've had data needs or when I've had situations I needed to address from um, community members who had complaints or concerns. He could give me the background and the, the perspective. Chances are he had already addressed the situation to some degree. Um, very, very humble, but very hardworking and uh, skilled and passionate young man. He came from Marinwood, but has been working with us. And I said, if there was anything I could do to hire him to keep him here, um, like create a BLS program, which is a basic life support program where I could get him because he's not a medic yet. He's um, just now leaving to go in and pursue a career in the fire service, but he's, he's actually taking training in January as a um, firefighter one trainee. And so at Chabot College in Hayward. And so that's why he's leaving is that he's got this opportunity to continue to pursue his ultimate desire, which is to become a structural firefighter. So um, I'm going to try, you know, my last best and final offer and try to make him an offer he can't refuse as if I was Tony Soprano or the Godfather or something and see if I can strong mark him to stay, whatever I can, I can do. I, I hate to lose Sean, but uh, he's going to be surely missed, but we, we really appreciate and respect all the work that he's done. And so I just wanted to share that with you all so that um, you understand that um, his last day is December 31st. Uh, and well, on another note, he's actually being getting married in a couple of weeks. So that's a exciting thing for him as well. So won't clear on a negative note, I'll clear on a positive note. Then that concludes my report. Well, thank you, Chief. It, that reminds me of a Mae West line when she was addressing some Boy Scouts and she said, I like you Boy Scouts, but come back and see me when you're 21. <laughs> so you can tell Sean to come back and see you after he finishes his education. There you and go. We'll hire him as a firefighter paramedic and he can rejoin the department. Uh, I'd, I'd like to train him to become a firefighter paramedic just so I don't lose him, right? So that way I keep him <laughs> moving here, but yeah. no such thing just yet. So that's great. Uh, good. Anyone else? Anything anybody wants to present to the fire commission? I actually had a question for the chief. Um, the AmeriCorps workers, so I've been seeing like in our neighborhood when I'm driving the pickup aid and these trees that are just huge, like sycamore trees and they're hanging over the electric lines. And I know that PG&E cuts, does some pruning and things like that, but they're over people's roofs. They're pretty bad. So is that the city's responsibility or is that the homeowner's responsibility? You know, I think if it's on the homeowner's property, it's the homeowner's responsibility. If it's on the sidewalk or clearly on the median, that becomes the city's responsibility. 
The, the other concern I have, though, is that if PG&E is aware of this, they should have been proactively assessing these lines and looking to clear these lines just to make sure public safety is not compromised. And so I'll give you an example. The, the lot next door to my home, there's no home there, but PG&E actually came out and trimmed back the, the, uh, the branches over some of the lines, but not all of them. And so it just, it was a concern. It was like, you only did part of it. You know, was it, you know, was it because you only had a concern about one or two branches? Well, I, see, I clear, clearly see some other, you know, hazards here. So um, I've seen them selectively get involved on pro private properties or private parcels. But um, what I can do is I can make sure if you have a specific area that you want me to, to know about, I can follow up with both PG&E and um, we can actually do something with the, the specific landowner as well to speak to our concerns. And, Primarily, I would like to put the responsibility on PG&E, and then anything that's encroaching over someone's home or roof, that should certainly be the homeowner to address that. But when it comes to branches intertwining, intertwining with the, the power lines, I would I'd rather see PG&E and go and handle that safely. Okay. Great. Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. Excellent. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, this is our holiday meeting, so... Normally, we would meet and have some refreshments, and uh, I would provide small little gifts for people. I hope you've gotten them at your home. I sent everyone a customized limited edition face mask with a limited edition San Rafael Fire Department patch. This patch is based on the decal on the doors of a fire truck, and uh, so that's where the design came from, and uh, those are getting very low in supplies. So you have a limited edition face mask. I have some more to give out to the BCs and to the chief, but uh, I wanna really thank everyone for participating throughout the year, for being very involved in the fire commission and supporting the fire department. Uh, it's just an honor to serve with you. And I wish everyone a Merry Christmas and uh, you know better times ahead, especially with the vaccine. So- thank, Merry Christmas thank, to all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Larry, yours is waiting in the mail. Thank you. Feliz, Feliz Navidad from. And I'll get those out for you guys to take a look at it and tell me what your preference is. Say that again, Chief. Said so I'll get the examples of the um, presentation. The, Beautiful. The uh, uh, certificates or certificates of appreciation, and uh, get your thoughts on which models you like before we we go to print. Thank you so much. That would be wonderful. Absolutely. All right. Deeply appreciate it. Okay. Keep in touch, everybody. Have a happy holiday and stay you safe. Too. Wear your mask. Thanks, Take care. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Happy Bye. holidays. Thank happy you. holidays. I like that, Stan. Bye. Happy Bye. holidays. Bye. Happy holidays.